Today's video is brought to you by Glass Spider Publishing. Offering a wide range of hybrid book publishing services, Glass Spider Publishing is your one-stop shop for professional editing, design, publication, and book marketing services. Visit glassspiderpublishing.com today to learn more. Welcome back everyone. For today's painting, I'm actually using a 16 by 20 inch canvas. You can always tell if I'm excited about a painting if I go up a size in canvas. So to get started on it, I am using my number 12 Filbert. Large, stiff brush, really excellent for getting the background covered very quickly. And I'm using ultramarine and matte medium as always. Remember that you want to thin this paint down with the matte medium because you don't want a heavy, dark, solid blue, just a little on the transparent side. I know it looks like I'm trying to make it look very smooth there, but really all I'm doing is trying to pick up areas where I deposited a lot of paint. My goal with doing this underpainting is to get rid of all of the white but to also make sure that it's a fairly smooth coverage, not color wise, just texture wise. I don't want any lines to dry in the paint that I'm gonna see later, you know, that, that are gonna have some texture. So that's the whole point between, or that's the whole point uh, as to why I'm smoothing the paint out. I really don't care if it looks scrubby and messy. I just don't want texture that I have to fight with later. And remember the point of an underpainting is to, first of all, get rid of the white spots so that you don't have to fight with the white of the canvas showing later, but it's also to give a color that's gonna support your painting. And I chose ultramarine here for a couple of reasons. First, the ultramarine really makes a gray sky look a little bit more alive, less flat. A gray sky can look kind of flat and lifeless and the blue underneath it helps support it a little bit. It also provides a nice contrast to all of the orange that's going to be in the ground and just kind of helps add a little bit of extra depth there. So those are the two main reasons why I do an underpainting. If you really insist, you don't have to do it, but I think that I think that if you do it, you'll see the value in it. And then I got out my blow dryer, made sure that underpainting is dry before we move on. And now I'm using my number eight filbert with a little bit of Payne's Gray and matte medium. Again, we want this Payne's Gray to be nice and transparent so we don't have to fight with it later. We can, we can sketch with it and kind of scribble and discover where our landscape is going to be without, you know, making it set in stone with thick, heavy, dark paint. I put my horizon there just a little above center and I'm just kind of given some texture to the, the distant horizon. I kind of saw them as being some very distant trees or something, but maybe you'll interpret it as clouds, whichever way you choose to go is perfectly okay. Let's get a nice, thin, soft shape on that horizon. And I'm bringing just a little bit of it down below the horizon, kind of angling it to the left. That's going to start the appearance that our ground is sloping down to the left. And down here in the foreground, where the grasses are going to be the closest to us, I added some extra shadow there because that's going to help us make the grasses in the foreground look like there's some height to them rather than just kind of 
a flat, a flat piece of land. Just keep that paint nice and thin. I'd rather have you have it too thin than too dark. So remember to load your brush with the matte medium first. Fill that brush with the medium, then get a little bit of paint. You can always get more paint, but if you apply too much paint in the first place, then you're kind of stuck with it. Now let's get some clouds up in the top, or we're setting the we're setting the value for the clouds at the top here. Don't worry about making cloud shapes. Just put this dark color where you feel like you're gonna want the darkest bits of your clouds. See, I'm just kind of scribbling it. I'm not worrying about making cloud shapes. That's detail work, that comes later. Alright, let's dry this. I want to make some of these areas darker, but I need to make sure that it's completely dry first so I don't pull paint up. Now I am going to load up with the paint first and just add a bit of medium, about 50% medium. So this color is going to be much darker and more opaque than in the first place. And I'm just going to put it where I really want some darkness to be. Keep that horizon line soft on the top and the bottom. That's how we're really going to get the effect that it's kind of a misty, cloudy, moody day. If your horizon is too crisp, then the air is going to seem very clear. It's not going to seem as misty. Really darkening up these clouds at the top. I want a really heavy, dark cloud cover. A lot of this blue ends up showing through my sky at the end. So hopefully that will help you kind of see the value in doing this. I know a lot of people are really resistant to doing underpaintings. And like I said, that's fine if you don't want to do it. But if you do a painting like this, the way I'm showing you, and you do it on a white canvas, I think you'll struggle, especially in the sky. Your sky won't be as dark as you want it. But if you use the blue, it's going to give it that glow that you kind of see even on a cloudy day. And I just picked up a little extra medium and kind of scumbled it through the sky because there will be some, some darker and lighter bits in there as well. And then the same thing on the ground here, just adding a bit of texture and direction with some of these super transparent gray bits. Clean number eight, loading up with some panes and a hint of, this is a Titan Buff or Unbleached Titanium. You could use just pure white, titanium white, if you really want to. You could use any other white alternative that we've talked about in the past, like Titan Violet, Titan Green, 
Liquitex's parchment, whatever you prefer. And I mixed up about a middle of the road gray, not too dark, not too light, added quite a bit of medium to it. And I'm going to paint it all through the sky where I left it blue. But I'm making sure to blend it very softly into that dark. We don't want any hard lines in this sky, none. Even where it meets the trees, I'm going right over top of all of those shapes. But keeping everything very thin so nothing is obliterated. Primarily, I'm using the edge of my brush, the side of it, to kind of scrub the paint around nice and thin. When I need some extra paint, I'll press it flat like there, and then back to the edge and scumble it out. Right over the horizon. All right, clean brush again onto the ground. We're gonna get some Payne's Gray and Burnt Sienna. Just looking for a nice dark, dark brown. We'll put just a hint of Ultramarine in it because that Burnt Sienna is very, very warm and I just wanted to kind of press down that warmth a bit. And of course, a good amount of medium. We don't want any opacity here. Keep things nice and transparent. kind of scribbling in all different directions, but with a focus on things moving down and to the left. But you want some variation. Don't have all of your brush strokes just go at a hard angle from the top right to the bottom left. Definitely go over top of that darker area in the front. I'm even going to mix up a very similar color, just maybe a little bit darker than what I did on the ground in the distance. And notice I didn't pick up any medium, so this is pretty opaque here. Nice and dark. Notice I didn't put this color all the way to the very back up to the horizon. Clean brush again, going back into my Payne's Gray and unbleached titanium. Nice dark color. This is going to be for our darkest clouds. Thank you. 
Now I'm going to start just slightly making cloud shapes, but it's, it's very soft. So the bottom of this area is going to be a little rounded, but it's also very faded out too. I don't have any hard cloud edges. And I do recommend that you bring this dark color down a little bit lower than you actually want it because when we add our lighter color, you're going to lose a little bit of it. So if you don't bring that dark color down far enough, then you won't have enough of it. And I'm using the same color on the trees that I have at the horizon. It's okay to leave just a thin area in the middle of the sky for your lighter color because we can expand it as far as we want later. A little bit lighter, I'm just mixing some more of that white into the gray that's already on my brush. So it's substantially lighter than what I just used. And we'll start building some of the area inside where it's gonna be the lightest. And you can see I'm overlapping that darker color. And I didn't let that darker gray dry before doing this. It doesn't really matter if your dark gray is dry, that's okay. And if it's not, that's okay too. All 
All right, let's go even lighter. Again, I did not clean off this brush. There's still a bit of that gray in there. And I didn't dry the canvas, so some of this paint's wet, some of it's dry. I'm gonna start building the lighter areas. Notice how my brush movements are a little bit more controlled. And I'm not scattering it all over the place. I'm just starting to build that area that I really want to glow. Now I'm gonna dry all of that because to really start building that glow in the center and the dark, dark shadows at the top, I don't want any blending. So I cleaned off my brush and all I'm picking up is the white and a little bit of medium. And we're gonna be very specific about where we put this, really paying attention to the shapes that we're creating. Definitely keeping that color a little bit heavier on the interior and then fuzzing the edges out so we get that nice misty effect using the side of my brush. Just take your time here and build the, the brightness in the sky as much as you need to, as much as you want to. And you could add some other colors into it if you want. If you want to give it a little bit more of like a sunsetty feel, you could add a little bit of some yellows and oranges or even pinks, whatever you feel like. If you want it to feel ultra stormy, you could add in a hint of purple or even do a, a purple underpainting instead of the ultramarine blue. That could be another way that you kind of build a bit of a, a stormy look in the sky. Just remember that painting is all up to you. So I show you what I like, what I want to see, but that doesn't mean that it's the only way that it can be done. Use it as a starting point. You know, you could get really crazy if you want and do like a hot pink underpainting and see what happens there. That could give you a very different vibe to what I end up with. You could use like a bright orange underpainting, which I've done both of those many times in the past you just get a different look and none of them are wrong or bad they're just different so always always feel free to experiment and explore if you don't have a color that i'm using it doesn't matter pick a color that you think is either looks similar or that you just want to see you know if you don't have ultramarine pick a color at random or whatever. You're never required to have the same materials that I have.
just pure white there. No medium, no nothing. This is going to represent the brightest bit in our sky. Notice I'm fuzzing out the edges, but I am not scrubbing that paint as thin as I have been. I did not clean off my brush. I'm just picking up the Payne's Gray, but the white that was left in my brush was so little that it's not really making a difference. If you have a ton of paint in your brush, go ahead and wash it off, but I wasn't worried about it here. This is primarily just Payne's Gray, and I'm really going to start darkening up the top edge of this sky, really make it look heavy and stormy. I mean, what's better than a fall storm? Not much, if you ask me. Just a point of medium to help me kind of break up some of those edges. Do make sure that you stand back while you're doing this part to make sure that you don't have uh, very patterned shapes on the bottom of these clouds. You know, you don't want to have this repeating pattern of, of swoops all the way across the top of the sky. Some of them should be bigger, smaller, thinner, fatter, you know, different heights and depths. Just make sure that there's variation. And sometimes you can't see that until you stand back. Same thing down here on these distant trees on the horizon. I'm just keeping it very low to the horizon. Nice and dark in there. That will sell that this is a, a distant area full of thick trees and uh, fog or mist or something. Did not clean my brush, just getting kind of a middle of the road gray. And we're going to pull these shapes upward into the sky just a little bit more. I'm 
It just felt like the brightness in the sky. It was a little too big. I just wanted that to be kind of concentrated toward the, toward the center of the shape. Grabbing those little points of medium also helps kind of re-wet some of the paint that's on my brush and apply it nice and thin, almost like a just a, a quick spot of glaze. Clean brush, we're going to work on the ground now and I have cadmium orange. I'm going to start with some of that. A little bit of ultramarine blue, kind of a, an equal balance. It will give us a nice dusty green. It's kind of a, a cool color. Tiny bit of the burnt sienna just to uh, get rid of some of the vibrancy. Bring it a bit more earthy and then a bit of white, which I don't usually add white to green because it can make it seem kind of chalky. But here I'm going for distance. This is going to be my most distant color on the ground and so I want it to seem a little bit foggy and chalky. And we're going to do this at the horizon, just below the horizon in that area that I left. I am overlapping the dark parts on the horizon and you don't want a hard line between them. And I'm pulling it down into the, the foreground just a bit. And then I will scatter just some of this throughout the foreground area, mostly just to give a little bit of support to the brighter colors that are coming and provide some opportunities for texture. Because what you don't want is this foreground to just be a big flat band of orange. That's not going to look real great. Just pulled a bit more blue into that. A little bit more white. Nice, light, smoky color. Just bits of that in the distance here. Cerulean blue would work really well here also. Cerulean is really great for adding kind of that smoky distance quality. 
I don't know if it would make quite the same green with the cat orange, but it would definitely work to help create distance. Did not clean my brush. I'm just gonna start adding some of the burnt sienna and cadmium orange to it. So it's a very muddy orange color, a little bit of medium, and we'll start pulling these, these colors forward. It's a nice transition from that distance color. As I come forward, I'm adding more of the burnt sienna and orange, which is slowly getting a little bit brighter because I'm not adding any more of the green. Remember that your most vibrant colors are gonna be in the foreground. They're gonna get less vibrant and more blue as they move away. Overlap that dark shape in the foreground. All right, I am moving on to my 5 8 inch angle and I'm just picking up some cad orange with a little bit of the burnt sienna, a little bit of medium, and I'm gonna be using the tip of the brush. See that? How I'm kind of crushing into the tip of it. And that's gonna help us get kind of these little, these little shapes. So I'll kind of crush into the tip of the brush, lay down some shapes, and then up onto the edge of the brush to dust some of them out a little bit. So I'm gonna do that all over the ground here. I'm just going back with the edge of the brush and just kind of breaking up some of those. It's a little heavily textured for me, but I think I'll fix that up later. For now, I'm gonna grab a bit more white and move into some of that messy green color I have. So this color is 
super muddy, super messy, and I'm just dusting it over this color again, just kind of helping assimilate it into the ground. This is also helping to take care of some of that texture that was a little bit aggressive for me. All right, clean brush, and I'm just getting some cad orange with a hint of burnt sienna. Nice bright color, just a little bit of medium. And I'm going to do the same thing. I'm still kind of crushing into the tip of the brush, but my movements are very small and very light, so I'm not applying a ton of this paint. Now I've got some alizarin crimson. I'm gonna pull just a little bit of that in, really start to warm up the color as it moves forward. And I am using the same brush technique for the most part. Quite a bit redder there. Just mix that dirty brush right into the alizarin. And this is actually going to start creating the, the grasses in the foreground. So I'm kind of moving in an up and down motion right over the edge of where the dark in the foreground meets the color grasses in the midground. we're going to have a fence here and these grasses are kind of blowing up against the fence and they're a little bit taller because you know it's harder to cut them down when they're growing up against the fence.
bit more of the cadmium orange. Just kind of go back and forth with your warm colors and maybe hit a little bit more of that green color. We're just looking for some texture. And by, by changing our colors in, in this ground, it's that color change that helps suggest texture. So we don't need to go in and, you know, do a bunch of stippling or different brushes or whatever. Just focus on using different colors here and there and not covering everything that you just did. If you're going to cover everything you just did, then there's no point in doing it. So don't cover everything. And if the texture is too aggressive, like I have a lot of texture there and I don't quite want that much texture, but I can go back later and glaze it down a little bit and soften it, which I'm going to do. That's actually kind of what I'm doing here. I did clean off my brush and then I loaded up with just the orange and burnt sienna and then a good amount of medium. And I'm very lightly kind of going over most of the things on the ground here and it's adding some of this transparent orange color which does help soften some of the texture without losing all of the colors underneath see so just pick up some more medium there's about a 50 50 mixture there of medium and paint Soften that texture a bit. All right, back to my number eight, and I'm getting some drips of water and some cadmium orange, and I think you know what's about to happen. As always, you can skip this if you really don't like flicking paint. I live to flick paint, but this is the only time I do it in this painting, so don't worry, I'm not going to try and get a flick paint throughout this painting. I'm getting nice and close to my canvas and I'm flicking slowly. So it's very controlled. And only in the foreground. You don't want to put this too far in the distance because you wouldn't really have that much detail in the distance. And while I've got that extra paint on my finger, might as well not waste it. Just kind of tap throughout to deposit a bit of it and maybe clean up any splatters that looked a little bit too blobby you can just kind of touch them and smear them out here My brush is probably about an inch from the canvas. If you keep your brush nice and close to the canvas and you're flicking in a very controlled way, you are not going to get paint all over the planet, I swear. This is my number six round and now I am using Mars Black. The reason I'm using Mars Black here is because I will get an opaque coverage for both the tree, the fence, and the scarecrow and I wouldn't really get that opaque coverage just using Payne's Gray. So I'm going to decide where the base of my tree is. It's going to be fairly distant. And we'll start drawing that shape in. And then worry about widening out the trunk. So don't worry about getting both the shape you know, the height of it and the width of it in one go. Just draw a thin line and then you can widen it out afterwards. Just some thin, scratchy branches.
kind of flattening out my brush there so that I can just get some kind of broken lines for these branches. I don't need them to be real solid or real crisp. Don't worry about making all of your branches here. Just get what you can. And when you feel like you're starting to struggle with the size of the brush, then stop and go to your number three, like I just did here. Use a little extra drip of water that helps keep uh, the paint flowing on your brush. And I'm just gonna scratch in some more branches. Very, very broken, very hazy the trees in the distance, things wouldn't be too crisp. If you do get a branch that gets away from you, you can either wipe it out with your finger like I did there a second ago, or just keep a clean, damp brush on hand like the, the angle brush would be perfect. And you can just come in and wipe away a branch that you don't like, as long as you get it before it dries, of course. And I'm just going to add a couple little, maybe offshoots down at the bottom here. And using my brush flat, just kind of scrubbing in a bit of this color onto the ground, I am going to uh, kind of blend it away. So don't worry about trying to make it look like grasses or anything like that. Just getting some of this color on the ground here. I felt like that was way too much. There's my angle brush. And I'm not erasing all of this color, just kind of smearing it out, softening it. All right, mixing a little bit of alizarin into that Mars black and just a tiny, tiny poke of the white. Really, it's just to open up the color so that you can see what the color actually is. Now, good amount of matte medium. I want this to be very transparent. And I'm just gonna dust some of this color here and there in the branches. You do want to make sure your branches are dry at this point so you don't smear them. But see how transparent that is. I'm not filling the entire tree, but you could if you want. And you could vary up the color as well if you like. It'll just make it look like it's Got some leaves on it, but maybe not as many as it used to. And then in just a couple of spots, I'm gonna apply a slightly thicker application of it. It's still very transparent. Dust a bit of it on the ground. A little thicker there, just break up the edges.
All right, we're gonna dry that. We want the tree to be completely dry. I'm just gonna darken just a few spots on the tree trunk. We're not gonna put too much detail in it. I'm not gonna do any highlights. I'm still using my number three, but I'm just gonna add a little bit of burnt sienna to the Payne's gray, or I'm sorry, to the Mars black. And just put a couple spots on it that are a little bit darker. It, it'll just kind of suggest shadows or textures. I'm also going to add just a few more little scratchy branches. All right, this is my long liner. So you do need an extra drip of water to make sure the paint flows. Picking up that same color mixture and just a last few little scratchy branches and then we'll be done with the tree. Zoom in here a bit so you can see how fine and delicate these branches are. If you're not able to do fine, fine lines like that, then don't worry about it. You can skip this part. I'm really only doing them for some extra texture to give the impression that it's full of a, br a bunch of twiggy branches, but you don't have to. Work within your abilities. All right, back to my angle brush and I'm picking up a little blue, a little orange, looking for that muddy green again. Also pulled just a hint of burnt sienna in there and then we'll lighten it up a bit. Nice dusty color. Going over the base of the tree, not to get rid of all of that dark color, just to kind of cover the, the bottom of it, make it look like it's growing on the hill and not plopped on top of the hill.
more orange and brown did not clean off my brush sorry I know you can't see that it's the same mixture just with a little more orange and brown and kind of swooping upwards to look like blowing grasses all right now I'm using my chalk pencil you can use any kind of pencil you like or nothing at all if you're you know okay with just going straight to paint but I want to plan out where my fence posts are going to be I want to make sure that they're all in a bit of a different place height wise I want to make sure that they're all a little bit of a, a different distance to each other and a bit of a different angle we just don't want very mechanical looking fence posts and then the the horizontal beams they can be wobbly they can break or fall down it's an old fence so it's not going to be real precise and some of my lines here are a little precise but as I add my paint I, I mess some of them up a bit and this chalk pencil is so easy to clean off as long as your paint is dry you can use the eraser on the back and get rid of it or just wipe over it with a damp paintbrush and it will get rid of the chalk I think you can probably get these chalk pencils at just about any place you buy art supplies I find that the chalk pencils are much easier to work with and they don't affect your paint anywhere near as much as watercolor pencils watercolor pencils can change the color of your paint they can be hard to remove and they can still show afterwards sometimes all right back to my number six round brush and I'm getting Mars black with a little extra drip of water on my brush of course so the paint flows and I'm going to start drawing in where my fence posts are going to go obviously I want it thicker than that but right now just like the tree I'm just focusing on getting the size and like the height and the positioning in there we'll widen it out later see how all of these posts they're just a little bit different and let that horizontal cross beam just kind of fade out because I decided I'm gonna have grasses that go up over top of this broken part of fence so I wouldn't even see the end of those those beams All right, now we can work on widening out the shapes and I'm going to start out by giving them a little flat spot on the top and then widening them down keep the very bottom of these posts kind of fuzzed out so that when you go to cover them up with the grasses later you're not fighting with a super solid uh, end at the bottom which can show afterwards and and cause you some cause you some grief so just let them fade out to nothing at the bottom
like my ghost shirt. I figured since it's September, I can start wearing all of my Halloween shirts. So this is my very favorite one. So you might see it a couple of times between now and at least Halloween. Let's be real. I'll probably wear it year long, uh, you know, weather permitting. And now we got to widen out the horizontal beams. Let those posts be a little wobbly. You know, like we said before, if it's an old fence, it's going to have some character to it. All right, moving on to my clean long handle number eight filbert. Mixing up a good amount of the ultramarine, a little bit of orange, kind of a dark dusty green. I'm even going to add some panes in it to keep it on the darker side. A little bit of the white just to open the color up. But this is a very gray down green. And we're going to start adding a few grasses in the foreground. Overlapping our fence, of course. Especially right here where I've got a broken bit of the fence. Painting up against the fence, this tall grass was actually my favorite part of the painting. I liked painting the scarecrow as well, obviously, but there was just something really satisfying about building the layers and everything and changing the plane. So we've got the ground that's laying flat and kind of angling to the left. And suddenly we've got these tall grasses standing up in front of it. And that was just kind of a, kind of a fun thing. So I cleaned off my brush and I just picked up a little bit of paints with some medium and we're going to create a darker area right in here and that's what's going to help us say that the field is full of these taller grasses as well just nice and dark right in there We will have a little bit of the flat ground in the foreground, so don't take this all the way to the base of the canvas, at least in the, in the highest part on the right there. Did not clean off my brush, just picking up some of the orange and brown with a little bit of alizarin, just looking for a super warm color here, but not overly light. In fact, we'll even throw in a bit more Payne's Gray there. Just a dark, warm color. And here we're going to start working on the, the flat part. There is a little bit of flat ground between us and the fence.
make sure that's completely dry. We're going to do a little bit of layering here and we want it to be dry, no blending. Back to my 5 8 inch angle and I'm going to get some more of that orange. It's kind of a muddy spot so it's not pure orange. Grabbing some more of that alizarin, nice and warm and a little bit brighter than the previous color. A little bit of white to kind of open that color up a bit. And as always a little bit of medium. Still working on the flat area. I'm going to be crushing into the tip of the angle brush just like we did in the field. little bit brighter just with more of the orange and the red and same thing clean brush going into my Payne's gray good amount of medium nice and transparent just a tiny bit of the burnt sienna to warm it up a bit and just one more darker there right at the base of those standing grasses Just lay down that little stripe of color and then flick it up at the top to indicate grasses. Swipe it out to the left at the bottom to indicate the ground. All right, now I'm gonna go to my number four filbert, my long handle stiff bristle brush. Mixing up that warm color again with the orange and the alizarin. And I'm going to use it flat here in the foreground and just kind of touch and wipe. This gives it just a little bit more detail than the field behind, but not so much that it's going to command too much of our attention. The, the thing you have to watch out for with this bit of ground at the bottom is you don't want it to be too detailed and you don't want the colors to be too bright because it's right at the bottom of the canvas and if that commands too much attention, it's going to take away from everything else in the painting. But if it's just a big dark swath at the very bottom of the canvas, then it might as well not be there at all. So I'm just suggesting some of this color and texture enough to say this belongs in the image, but don't look at it too much. A little bit more of that muddy color. Nice and dark and muddy. Sometimes mud is exactly the color that you want. Open that color up with a bit of white. All right, substantially more than that. <laughs> We're actually going for a lighter color. Just for some little detail grasses that are standing up. 
So don't go crazy and do this all across the bottom. I just kind of do it in a few spots. Clean brush, same brush, warming that color up just a little bit more. This is a little bit pinky, but I feel like it works. I'm not adding very much of this color at all. Right back to my number three round and I'm picking up some of my white and just kind of mixing it into that muddy color just looking for a very pale color but not the pure white you know I'm just gonna create a couple of you know individual grasses don't go crazy with this bit but I think just having some of those little thin light shapes it helps just really sell the point that it's grasses and then a little bit flat here and there just to give it some bulk at the bottom Cleaned off my brush, a little bit of brown into the Payne's Gray, just a nice dark warm color. And I'm going to do the same thing with this. Just a few scratchy grasses.
All right, I cleaned off my brush. I got some Mars Black and then just kind of rolled a tiny bit of the white in, swiped it down on the palette, picked it back up. It's just a very loose and dirty mixture of the two colors. That's going to help me get some streaking so that when I paint the highlights on the wood, it's not just like a big gray streak. It'll have a little bit of variation to it, making it look very weathered. So I'll show you how I load that up each time. So I've got the black on my brush. I poke into the white, swipe it down on the palette, and then pick it back up. It's a very dark mixture right now, but we'll build up to the lighter, the brighter highlights for the wood. Poke into the white, lay it down. That actually left me with a lot of paint, so I didn't need to swipe it back up. And of course we want to do the same thing on the horizontal beams and I just picked up a little medium because I had plenty of paint on my brush. Don't worry about the grasses. If you overlap them, it'll just push the grass to behind the fence. If you overlap too much of it, you can, you can paint that grass back in. So don't worry about it. Just some Mars Black and a little medium here to maybe get rid of any of the highlights that I thought were too much or add in a little extra shadow.
I put a little bit of the burnt sienna in this, though I don't really think it made a whole lot of difference, just for some final little points of highlight. You could do it, you could skip it, whatever you prefer. I didn't really notice much of the brown in there. I wanted this fence to stay quite dark, but that doesn't mean that you wanna leave it black and not have any bright highlights on it. It's just about having some highlights on it. That's what gives it a little bit of dimension and, and reality. So I'm going back to my chalk pencil and I'm gonna start sketching out where my scarecrow is gonna be. I'm ignoring the fence. As you'll see, I paint over the fence, just keep it damp clean brush handy and you can easily just wipe it away. I'm first figuring out how tall my scarecrow is going to be. That line there was for the hat brim. This line here is for the arms. So just figure out the height, where the hat is going to be, where the arms are going to be, and everything else is going to be just simple shapes to fill in. Using my 5 8 inch angle, getting some of the Burnt Sienna and some Mars Black, just a super, super dark brown. A little bit of medium. That was actually a pretty good amount of medium. And we're going to start by filling in the face. Do not just draw a big circle here. We want him to be rough looking. He's been hanging out in this field for a lot of years and he was made by hand out of straw and rags and things. So he's not gonna have any real solid, distinct shapes. So let it be messy and scrubby and let your brushwork get away from you a little bit. All of that is okay. It's gonna make him look better. So just a general shape for the head and the body. And then I'm just gonna kind of scrub out some, some kind of sticky straw type for the bottom of him. Maybe it's just full of straw and it's just a bunch of straw that's poking down or bundles of sticks or rags or something. But he doesn't need legs. He's not about to get up and walk around. At least we hope not, because that's creepy. But it's just an old scarecrow. Gave him a little bit of kind of a rumpled collar there and generally attached his head to his body with a neck. And now the brim of his hat. And gave him kind of a kind of a collapsed, rumpled looking hat on top. The farmer who built him is not gonna give him his best hat. It's going to give him an old hat that's kind of crushed and falling apart. Clean and damp brush, and I'm just wiping away where I painted over top of the fence, because I want to keep the scarecrow in the field, behind the fence. If it's easier for you, you can just highlight the fence after you paint the scarecrow. Number six round, just getting some Mars Black. And I'm going to start filling him in a little bit and maybe changing the shapes a bit. I'm going to change the shape of his hat a little bit, but still keep it kind of rumpled looking. And we'll add some little grasses. See, I had a brush mark that got away. That's fine. There's some little grasses and straw bits poking out of there.
I love little bits of the straw poking out of his collar as well as under his hat and just anywhere. If there's a spot that you think, God, I don't know, this spot looks weird, then just put a bunch of straw poking out of it. I think that's perfectly okay. And then I'm taking the opportunity to fill in the shape for the most part with this heavy black application of paint. On the bottom of his arms here, we're gonna make it look like he's covered in rags and things like that. I'm just flicking downward very randomly. I'm not doing just a, a sharp, hard line of these flick downs along his arms. Some parts are longer than others. Some almost have no little flicky downy bits. So just enjoy it and kind of make him look Make him look a little rough and old, because he is. And some little grassy bits poking out where his hands would be. And I had that weird little bump on the top of this arm, so I'm going to make some little grasses poking out of it. Same thing here on his body, filling in that shape with the black. Really getting some grassy bits poking out down on, on the leg area as well as on his sides. cleaning off that fence post again. Just putting in the post that's holding him up. Again, let it fade into the grasses. Just let it disappear down there. Still using my number six, mixing some burnt sienna in with the Mars black, nice dark brown color. Bit of medium. 
and we're going to start lightening it. I wanted to, I was kind of going back and forth between leaving him like a silhouette and full painting him like with lots of colors. So I kind of went half and half. So this color is very dark and I'm just suggesting some highlight on his face, which I will amp up as we go. But I work toward all of the colors on him very, very slowly. So he's kind of halfway between a silhouette and full color. Did not clean my brush, going straight into my super dried out ultramarine blue and lightening it a bit. This color is going to be for his hat and his shirt. Not filling everything in, just kind of like we did on the fence post. I'm just choosing a side to add the highlight and the color to and kind of sticking with that. And it's just little swipey bits of the color, which I know you can't really see here because it's really dark. But as I lighten it up, you'll be able to see exactly where I'm putting it. But my brushwork is very loose and I'm allowing the brushwork, the, br the brush marks to show and the black underneath it to show as well. More blue and a little more white. Get that dusty old denim color. Lighter and bluer. I did not clean off my brush. It still has that dusty blue color on there. We're just going to add some more of the burnt sienna and white to the Mars black here and get a little bit more in his face. A little bit of the cadmium orange because we want to make the straw just a little bit of a different color. This is my number zero round brush. Very, very tiny round brush. I picked up some Mars Black and a lot of medium. I want this color to be very transparent. And I'm gonna add just a tiny bit of the ultramarine blue as well because that cool tone will help create distance in these shapes that we're about to do. We're gonna put a few birds in the sky. If you have a scarecrow, it's probably because there's crows around, so. We're gonna make some teeny little crows in the distance. It's just a simple V. Let me zoom you in here and we'll do a couple more. A little V. But at the bottom it kind of overlaps, so kind of indicates either a tail or a beak or something. Do a bunch of them at different shapes, different angles, different sizes. And I even just do a couple little points 
Those are super distant ones. I didn't go crazy with the birds here. I didn't want to spend too much time on them. Just to give you an idea of how you would do that, do as many of them as you like. I'm even just doing a simple little shape on the tree branch here. It's almost just a blob. Still using that number zero round, same color. Very, very transparent. And I'm going to kind of scumble into these tree shapes in the distance. Just some little sticky bits at the very bottom of some of the bulkier shapes to say that maybe there's tree trunks or something in there. It's almost just like a little up and down scribble. Don't try to draw actual tree trunks and branches. It's going to create too much detail and ruin the perspective. If it's too dark or too distinct, I kind of swipe it out with my finger there to soften it. As that dries, it'll become more transparent. I know it looks like scribbly lines right now, but if you use a good amount of medium as it dries, it will sink into the paint that's already there and it won't look quite that scrubby, I promise. If you don't use any medium or you use very, very little, it might stay looking like that. All right, back to our scarecrow guy and my number six. A much brighter blue, a much lighter blue. Let's really give him some color on his clothing and his hat. Highlight his brim in front of his face. That's how it's going to make it look like a hat, and not just a weird shape on top of his head. A little more white for one last pop of this color. Gave him a little pocket there. Even scarecrows like to have pockets in their jackets. Did not clean off my brush again. Back into the brown mixture for his face. Adding more of the burnt sienna and more of the white color. 
having a hard time getting it lighter there. Yeah, we're just going to mix it right over here. There we go. A little swipe down the side of his face and his chin area. I like the idea of him having a heavy shadow under the brim of his hat so the top of his head is just all dark. And I do give him some creepy eyes in a little bit. You could skip that if you really don't want him. And just add a, a tiny bit of this color into some of the some of the grasses poking out. More of the orange for the grasses at the bottom of him. I know you can't really see that, but I just gave him a few tufts of grasses poking out of his jacket. Back to my zero, just dunking straight into the white. A tiny point and streak. And another tiny point and a streak. I am gonna glaze those down, but I have to let it dry first. So we're just gonna put those little pops right in the center and we'll come back to that. Five eighths inch angle, we're gonna get some burnt sienna and some orange. And I'm going to kind of touch up some of the grasses here and there in the distance. If you are happy with the way your ground looks, you don't have to do this. If you're gonna do it, just kind of mix up some different colors and I'm gonna do some grassy shapes so kind of the the swoop upward like grasses standing up. I'm not gonna talk you through all of my color changes. I go through quite a few. Just experiment and see what you like.
All right, cleaned off my brush. I'm mixing up a nice warm color with some of that orange burnt sienna, alizarin crimson. I just want to pop just a little bit the colors in the foreground. Again, just remember it's very important that these colors are not as bright and as intense as the field. We want the same colors in the foreground that are in the field, but we don't want them competing with everything else in the painting. All right, let's finish up his face. This is my number three. I've got Mars Black and a good amount of medium, nice and transparent. I'm just gonna lightly swipe over his eyes to just kind of push that brightness back into the distance a bit. And while I'm at it, I'll just use this as an opportunity to punch in a couple extra shadows here and there. Tiny indication of a mouth. And that is everything there is to this painting. Thank you so much as always for watching and painting along with me, everyone. And I hope to see you again very, very soon.